Dion is lead economist uh, at the World Bank and he's co-author of the World Development Report. This is the first WDR that's entirely devoted to education in the 40 years of the WDR. Obviously other reports have incorporated reflections on education. 2004 was on service delivery with a big focus on education, jobs, gender. All of these reports have touched on education, but this is the first one that's entirely devoted to education. Obviously, there was a temptation to try to be an encyclopedia on matters related to education, uh, but that is actually, that's not the tack we took. We decided to focus very much on the issue of learning, because we saw this as crucial to realizing education's promise. And schooling is not the same as learning. We heard a little bit about that. It's maybe not new, but actually it's uh, often a very ignored and has been a very ignored aspect of global education, or education in many countries. What do we mean by that? Well, in three East African countries, when children were asked to read a paragraph that included a sentence like, the name of the dog is puppy, only about 25% of third graders, after three years of schooling, actually could read that and know what it meant. Obviously that means, since you're all math wizards, that 75% could not understand that sentence. In rural India, after three years of schooling, children are asked to do a two-digit subtraction like this one. Again, 75% of third graders, after three years of schooling, could not do that. And even after five years of schooling, half could still not correctly do that two-digit subtraction. Um, a different aspect of learning around the world. Brazil, which between 2003 and 2015 on the PISA test actually did fairly well, increased uh, fairly substantially. You should know the median change from round to round in the PISA is zero. So actually they've been doing pretty well. But at that rate of improvement, it's going to take them 75 years to reach the OECD average. Just projecting out. This isn't a prediction. This is just a, obviously a simple uh, mathematical extension of the line. In reading, at the rate of their progress, it's going to take over 260 years to reach the OECD average, of course, unless something dramatic changes. This is where Brazil wants to be. And at the current rate of progress, it's just going to take them a long time to get there. These aren't just little anecdotes here and there. If we look, uh, if we assemble all the international assessments that have been done around the world, try to put them on the same scale, draw a, a level, I'd call that a minimum proficiency level. It actually doesn't matter exactly what it is. But just know that in a large number of high-income countries, over 90% of kids reach that level. So everybody's achieving that level of proficiency in these high-income countries. If we now expand our view and look around the world, what we can see is in high-income countries, but especially in middle and low-income countries, the share of students towards the end of the primary school cycle who reach that minimum proficiency level is incredibly low. So whereas 99% of Japanese kids reach this proficiency level, only 7% of, of students in Mali reach that level towards the end of primary school. So this is why we call it a learning crisis. Maybe it's not a new term, but actually we think it's an important way of framing the issue. This is a crisis because it's come to light, not so much because it's been a shift in what's been happening. It's not like a macroeconomic crisis. Uh, it's a crisis in that now the light has been shone on this through the emergence of a lot of data around the world. Another aspect of the crisis beyond low levels and slow progress is high levels of inequality. Um, we can draw graphs like this for many countries around the world, many regions around the world. Uh, just to give you a sense of high levels of inequality, in Cameroon, among girls in the richest quintile of the, of the student population, about 75% reach this level that the test makers, this is the PASAC test for Central and Western Africa, um, deem as sufficient to continue schooling. Among girls in the poorest quintile, only less than, uh, just less than 10% reach that level that the test makers deemed as sufficient for continuing schooling. So lo very low levels, slow progress, and high inequalities together is what we um, argue constitutes the learning crisis. Of course, these learning differentials sit on top of remaining access differentials. This just illustrates from a few countries around the world uh, the share of 15 to 19 year olds that have completed each grade. Um, you can see socioeconomic differences in who even starts school in a number of countries, or socioeconomic differences that emerge after several years of schooling.
Um, and in some countries, you see these sort of cumulative differentials. This is girls in the poorest quintile, who in these two particular countries are, are even below the average for the poorest group. So this is, a focus on learning is not to declare sort of access um, achieved, um, but we would argue that thinking of these together is how we should be moving forward. Getting kids to, into school, getting all kids into school, and all kids learning, which is the bank's tagline, as you may know, learning for all. Um, education has great promise. I don't really need to argue <laughs> or make this case to, to you in the room. It delivers jobs, incomes for individuals, it reduces family poverty, the level of nations, it can drive productivity and growth. It's one of the key drivers of poverty reduction of nations. Not just the pecuniary aspects that matter. Education delivers healthy and better educated families. It, it promotes resilience um, and adaptability of households. Um, and it arguably promotes better institutions and service delivery more generally within countries and promotes civic engagement. These are all the promise of education. Too often, we argue in the report, education fails to deliver on that promise. A number of reasons. One, education can't do it alone. Even though this is a report focused on education, we, and we don't spend a lot of time talking about the other factors that make education deliver, it's important to recognize that if labor markets are distorted, it's no surprise that education doesn't yield its full return. Or if social norms are such that women can't participate in the labor market, then it's no surprise that well, then, it, it, we, we, it, it, then it, it's a fact that women who are educated won't receive the full return to their education. So education is one part of a set of things that have to happen for education to deliver on its promise. But learning and the lack of learning is a big part of why education doesn't deliver. If we look at the level of individuals or live at, uh, at the level of nations, evidence is pointing more and more to the role of learning itself as actually being key to delivering on the promise of education. So the first, the, the, the sort of the poor learning outcomes are the first part of the learning crisis, but how do teaching and learning break down? In the report, we go through a number of ways, and we summarize this sort of with the schematic, with learning at the center, and the various factors at the school and household levels that need to come together to actually deliver learning. Learners who are prepared, teachers who are there and motivated, school inputs that are fu functioning and actually support teaching and learning, and school management that sort of brings it all together. So how do these break down? Well, students often, as we saw in the previous graph, the children don't arrive at school. And, and even when they do arrive, they're often unprepared to learn. This is pretty fascinating uh, new evidence from brain scans of infants in Bangladesh. And what you see here is the neural connections and the patterns of brain activity among these infants. This is an infant who grew up in a non-deprived household. And this is an infant who grew up in a high uh, sort of a, a household that exposed to high deprivation. And you can see the very density of neural connections and the activity of brain development is different. These children, unless they uh, get some sort of remediation, uh, would just will not be ready to learn at the same rate as, as the others. This shows up in a sort of a different way here. This is from the multiple indicated cluster surveys from UNICEF. Um, this shows between ages five, uh, three and five, the proportion of children in these two countries who recognize 10 letters of the alphabet. We don't show the slide to argue that children age three should recognize 10 letters of the alphabet, but we use it to illustrate the point that these children from the richest quintiles are arriving with a substantial advantage just in these basic cognitive abilities when they start schooling. This is another aspect of how kids, many kids arrive to school unprepared or less prepared to learn. Um, teachers, and how do teaching and learning break down? Well, some of you may be familiar with the service delivery indicator surveys in a number of African countries, which arrive at schools un unannounced. And this shows the, in the blue here the, per the percentage of teachers who are absent on the day of that unannounced visit, uh, and which averages about 20% across these countries. Uh, perhaps you don't know that another 20 percentage of teachers are at these schools but not teaching, even though it's ostensibly the teaching and the time they should be teaching according to the schedule. So just on the, on the, uh, uh, from the get-go, you're getting a 40% reduction in your teaching and learning time. 
Um, when we test these teachers in terms of their ability, we find that very few actually master the curriculum that they are teaching. This is the grade four curriculum. These are grade four teachers. Um, and we test them with items from the grade four curri curriculum. And there's a lot of variation across countries, but the shares who actually master that average about 50% across these countries. Um, school inputs, we see often school inputs that don't arrive at the school, and even when they do, they're not used. I mean, two examples, Brazil, one laptop per child, which took years to put in place to get the, you know, four or five years from the decision to get them to schools uh, for the laptops to actually show up, and then surveys were done, and they found that most teachers weren't actually using these laptops because they didn't know how, the electricity wasn't there. So have to think of how actually inputs will elevate teaching and learning, and often they don't. Um, and last, this is actually some pretty interesting research on, on school management and just the lack of school management capacity in the education sector. Um, this is work by Nick Bloom and others, which shows in the blue here you see the distribution on this management score of school principals. Uh, and you can see that in the middle and the lower income countries, just the management capacity of school principals is lower than in the richer countries. But kind of almost more interestingly is within countries, if you can compare to small firms, which is what this manufacturing sector distribution is, the management capacity of principals is lower than that of these uh, small firm heads. So there is potentially management capacity in these countries, but it's not in the education sector. So these are at the level of the school, how schooling and learning break down. But as we argue in the report, that's just one part of the story. You actually need to step out and think of why these things are allowed to persist. How, sorry, this is, I'm trying to keep track of my time here, but now it's asking me for bedtime. <laughs> like, do I want to be in bedtime mode? Um, sorry. Um, why are these allowed to persist? And we argue you have to step back and think about the systemic issues that lead to poor teaching and learning. And we identify two barriers to learning at scale. One, it's just technically hard to get a system aligned uh, throughout. So you, one needs coherence and between things like curriculum, teacher preparation, teacher evaluation, student assessment. And we often see reforms to one part of that equation and the others stay the same with bad outcomes. And one example of what we have in mind by this is that, you know, the outcomes-based education that was tried out in South Africa in the early 2000s inspired by Finland, where you know, granting a lot of autonomy to teachers really was great and really led to better learning outcomes. When South Africa, granting a lot of autonomy to these teachers who had low capacity, low preparation, low support, access to few materials, actually led to pretty much nothing and arguably a uh, delay in development of the South African education system. But it's not just the technical complexity. The politics of education are paramount, and we have to take those seriously. This, this schematic is, it tries to illustrate this with all these different actors in the education system, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the civil society organizations, um, the private sector, all of which have interests which may include learning, but actually they have multiple interests outside of learning. Um, and these competing objectives, we argue, pull actors away from a focus on learning. Um, politicians that are trying to get re-elected and trying to, you know, uh, take action that is, is more visible, perhaps, than learning. Bureaucrats that are trying to please the, the politicians. The private sector, perhaps, who's trying to argue for lower taxes rather than better skills. A whole host of reasons why people, why these various actors, are pulling out of alignment uh, from learning. So an example of this, Indonesia in the uh, mid and late 2000s basically negotiated a, a, a grand settlement where they would double teacher salaries in exchange for teacher certification, a, a reform that looked great on paper. Um, well, when it actually push came to shove and the political negotiation had to happen to actually put that into effect, the certification process was basically watered down to the point where all teachers got the teacher salary doubling. And as some of you may know, careful research really showed that ultimately this had no impact on teacher behavior or student learning outcomes. So really, that political process we have to take quite seriously when we think of, of education systems. As a result of all of this pulling away from alignment with learning, 
we argue that, that systems get stuck in low accountability, low learning, and high inequality equilibria. And an equilibrium, we argue, is it's important to think of that as a concept because when you're in an equilibrium, it's hard for one actor acting alone to sort of change things because the minute you try to, to get out of that equilibrium, actually you're pulled back into it. So, this has been a pretty depressing story so far. Uh, the report itself is actually about half diagnosis and description of problems, and about half, we would argue, uh, recommendations and, and ways we think one could move forward. We look around the world, we do see success. We see how Korea grew after the, after the Korean War. Uh, through decades of focus on what they call progressive universalism, expanding access at high quality, to the point where Korea became one of the premier education systems in the world. We see Vietnam when they were tested on PISA in 2012 doing better than, or as well as Germany. Uh, and it's not just a PISA phenomenon, we see other data from things like Young Lives or even EGROV results that show that this isn't just a PISA phenomenon. Uh, we see reforms in Peru that really led to some rapid increases in learning outcomes. And you look here at the level of classrooms we see in India, Liberia, Papua New Guinea, it's possible to really improve reading in those cases through targeted intervention. So success is possible. It's, it's not a dire, dire story by any means. It's even possible to try to um, mobilize action at the political level, as, as we'll come back to a little bit in Malaysia and Tanzania have tried to do. Um, we wrote the sentence and then we really, afterwards we thought, can we really write that sentence in a WDR? It just seems so stupid, actually. It seems so tautological, so obvious. Countries need to take action to show, showing that learning really matters to them. But actually, if you step back and you think about the actions that countries take in the realm of education or in the realm of things that affect education, they are often not consistent with learning being the thing that they're trying to achieve. And so we actually thought, <laughs> Quite, it's actually quite important to leave that sentence in there and stand behind it. We argue there are three big axes for addressing the learning crisis. First, to assess learning, to make it a serious goal. So assessing learning, and it, the, the first attribute of assessing learning is to shine a light on the hidden exclusion of low learning. And we borrowed this expression from Save the Children, the hidden exclusion which we think it really is apt here, because when children are not in school, we see that. I'm sure many of you have been in towns and villages around the world, you see kids who are out of school. When we do household surveys, we can measure easily who's in school and who's out of school. When, student, when kids are in school, not learning, it ends up being a hidden exclusion. And shining a light on that through assessing learning is, a, is an important part of, of what assessment does. Notice this is assessing learning. This isn't high stakes exams. This isn't sort of teaching to the test and all of that. This is assessing learning to shine a light on the low levels of learning. When UNESCO Institute for Statistics did an assessment of which countries had the data to be able to measure the uh, sustainable development goal indicators uh, for the end of, for learning, for the end of primary and lower secondary school cycle. They basically found that only between 50 and 60 percent of countries had the data to actually know where they stood in terms of the SDGs. And fewer still had the data to be able to track over time and know, you know where these countries were going, because obviously you need comparable data over time to be able to do that. So clearly, both at a sort of a, 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 a lower level, the shining a light on low learning, and at a global level to know where things are, where things are, where countries are, or at a country or global level to know where countries are and where they're going. Assessing learning is, we argue, a first step um, in this process. Second, acting on, and one could argue with evidence, to make schools work for all learners. So here in the report, we revisit that sort of a framework of what are, what, what are the immediate, what are the proximate determinants of low levels of learning. And we argue that actually the, we've learned a lot over the last 15, 20 years of what actually can make a difference. Early child development, uh, there's more and more evidence that's accumulating on how to get kids prepared and ready for learning. Cash transfers, getting kids into school, obviously you need a lot more to get them to learn once they're there. And remediation, we argue, is important at various points in, this, in the system to help kids um, um, be on track. Um, just to give you a sense of what's possible, you obviously, uh, well, not obviously, I'm sure many of you know the results from Jamaica where intervening early 
with kids, uh, with stimulation, really uh, resulted in 25% higher wages or, uh, later on in life. In Burkina Faso, cash transfers, uh, increasing girls' school participation by 20%. So it's possible to make a big difference in getting kids to school and even getting them uh, prepared for, for more learning. Thinking about teachers and what one can do to ensure that teachers are skilled and motivated, we argue that better professional development is pretty important. Uh, one of the ways we sifted through the evidence um, here was we, we, we decided not to do another systematic reviews. Uh, there were systematic reviews and there were systematic reviews of systematic reviews. What we wanted to do is to highlight where we saw practice being very different from what those reviews suggested could make a difference. And professional development, we argued, is an area where the evidence suggests you can make a huge difference. But that professional development looks nothing like the professional development we see in practice, which is to take teachers out of a classroom, send them away somewhere, give them a lecture, send them back to the classroom and hope for a miracle. The professional development that works, and we spent billions of dollars of that around the world, that professional development that works is with teachers in classrooms, giving feedback repeated with mentors or peers, um, and that's reinforced over time. Um, just to, again, to give you a sense that, 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 that we aren't hopeless in this story, uh, in Liberia, doubling the rate of fluency from pedagogical training, teach, training these teachers to actually assess students in the classroom, formative assessment, and then giving them the pedagogical tools to actually respond to that, made a big difference to reading. In Kenya, all students benefited from tracking, uh, grouping by ability, which allowed teachers to teach to the level of those children and actually adapt the teaching and learning. And all students, the, the more advanced and the less advanced, uh, benefited from that. Last, it's possible to improve the inputs and um, the management to actually make a difference um, to learning outcomes. Uh, perhaps some of you are familiar with the MindSpark evaluation, which showed that sort of leveraging technology, but using it actually quite, uh, using it to enhance the teaching and learning process uh, double the rate of learning from this adaptive software. Uh, uh, last, some of the, you, you may be familiar with uh, the work um, by Fryer in Houston, where basically training principals to observe and guide teachers made a big difference. So improving the management capacity of the principals to provide feedback to principals made a huge difference to, to actually learning outcomes. Okay, so that's two minutes or three, two. Okay. Um, but just as we looked at sort of the proximate determinants of low learning uh, uh, and the more systemic determinants, I think we argue it's also important to think about how you can intervene to change that poor equilibrium and to actually get the various stakeholders focused in on learning. And so here we argue it's important to align the actors to make the whole system work for learning. And here we have three entry points, information metrics, coalitions and incentives, and innovation and agility. What do we mean by that? Well, information and me metrics, I mean, we have in mind something like, but a slightly, slightly expanded version of the PISA shock. How you can provide information into a system to actually unsettle the system so that um, it can be realigned. Um, the example of Tanzania is probably one that's more relevant to most countries, where a combination of low uh, exam leaving scores, uh, the citizen-led assessments uh, carried out by Uweza that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, and then service delivery indicators all showing pretty bad outcomes and how teaching and learning were breaking down at the level of the schools, put incredible amount of political pressure on the system, which then resulted in what became a big reform program or the big results now in education program, which is sort of going through changes. The point is to illustrate not that that's been a success, it's too soon to declare success for that reform program, but to say that the combination of these, in, this information was enough to upset the traditional uh, balance and move things forward. Second, coalitions and incentives. We argue it's important to recognize that to achieve sustainable change in education, you actually need to build a coalition around learning. And that can happen in a number of ways. We point to the case of Chile. Chile is not a perfect, I think, in education, there's no perfect example for anything. But what's important about Chile is this was a long-term negotiated process that had lots of give and take, that had opt-in reforms to bring along teachers' unions. Um, and over time, that built confidence and, and resulted in substantial improvements in, learning out, in average learning outcomes, obviously, as we know, with some high levels of inequality, too. In Malaysia and Tanzania, they try to short circuit some of this by bringing together people in these lab models, which were actually something like two month long decision making, consultative 
experiences where the idea was to bring high-level decision makers along with all those stakeholders, with the private sector, with teacher unions, with parent associations, and actually sort of diagnose together, but more importantly, uh, uh, um, make a path for, for, for progress. Last, innovation and agility. We argue that um, in order to figure out how to improve learning in a local context, systems should take from within their system what seems to be working, or from outside you know, global evidence, and then adapt it through iterative and adaptive processes. And we give some examples of countries that have tried to do this. So Burundi, for example, in terms of their teacher, the, their textbook distribution, used kind of an experience that had worked well in one region and expanded that out to the country as a whole, very successfully in an iterative way. Or India, when Pratham basically showed how grouping worked outside of the actual school context, uh, then they worked with state government to actually try out different models to see what would actually work in the real context of, um, um, of, of, of public schools in terms of achieving learning outcomes in, in, a, in, a, in the context of actually regular school delivery. So together, we are, also we argue that external actors have a, role, have a big role to play in each of these entry points by enabling the generation of information and metrics, by recognizing the importance of, of these coalitions for learning and not try, try, trying to circumvent them, and by having approaches that are much more open to adjustment, innovation, and agility, rather than rigid approaches. So in short, the WDR is arguing for an aligned system that's focused on learning, with assessing learning to make it a serious goal, with acting on and with evidence to make schools work for all learners, and to align all the actors to make the entire system work for learning. So, thank you.